Salutare tuturor, mă numesc Andrei Baciu și bine ați venit la podcastul de vorbă. În acest episod am o mare bucurie să vorbesc cu un frate deosebit care se ocupă de lucrarea Team Challenge. Ați mai auzit la podcastul nostru cu ce se ocupă Team Challenge. Îi ajută pe oamenii care sunt robiți de anumite dependențe să fie liberi prin puterea Domnului Iisus Hristos. Și astăzi am ocazia să vorbesc cu cel care conduce această lucrare globală, fratele Ron Brown. Vreau să vă anunț de la început că acest podcast va fi în engleză, dar veți avea subtitrarea în română. Brother Ron, may God bless you. Thank you, Andre. It's great to be with you. <laughs> Thank you so much for honoring our uh, invitation. Uh, I'm so glad to actually speak with you and hear the, the amazing things that God has done in your life. So, how are you today? I'm doing very well, excited about Jesus. He's my savior, he's my Lord, he's my friend, he's my everything. And so thank you for inviting me to come on your podcast and I pray that the Lord will continue to bless it and use it for his glory. <laughs> thank you so much. We actually had a very short conversation before starting this, um, recording this podcast and I shared a little bit with you about our vision, what we're trying to do here. <laughs> and yesterday I actually heard a very nice sermon preached by you and the whole message was kind of like this you can be free indeed through the power of the holy spirit yes. and in jesus christ's name yes and yes. F- before uh, going uh, deeper and deeper in your life how how did you give your life to christ and all that i just wanted to ask you how can someone be free today let's say someone has addictions whether it's pornography whether it's drugs whether it's uh, toxic relationships whether it's trauma from the past mm-hmm, mm-hmm. how can someone be free can you actually be free today absolutely you can be free that's why Christ came the apostle paul said it was for freedom that Christ came to make us free and and he encouraged the church in galatia and don't return to that yoke of bondage so we have choices to make um and i believe that freedom is a choice Uh, we can choose to follow the Lord. When we choose to follow Him, then we live in the boundaries uh, of what He says is acceptable uh, for for our lives. And when we live according to His Word and do those things that are acceptable according to the biblical standard, then we are free. We're free from ourselves. We're free from our own opinions. We're free from our own limitations, the opinions of others. Um, and we're free to now be bonded to Jesus Christ. Wow. So our freedom is not just to do whatever we want, but our freedom is also gives us the choice now that we don't have to sin, we don't have to do evil things anymore. We can now make good choices uh, and now I can be a bond servant as the apostle Paul said, I now become a slave or a bond servant to Christ. So you can choose who you will serve. There's an old song years ago that says you're going to serve somebody. Uh, no matter what station of life that you're in, you might be the king of a country or a great leader, uh, but you will serve someone. And so now when Christ comes into our lives and he sets us free from the power of sin that controlled us, now we can choose who we will serve. And now we choose to serve the Lord. So that's the freedom that we have. We have freedom now to choose to serve the Lord. That's amazing. Just, I, I just wanted to let you know, if you want to sing throughout this podcast, you can do this. <laughs> this, is a, a, this is a free environment. Uh, because yesterday when I actually saw you uh, preaching, you're, at some point you were like, hallelujah to the name of Jesus. And you say hallelujah, and then just going uh, left to the right on the stage. And what I noticed about you is that you have true joy. It's yes. not just excitement. And you actually said a verse yesterday that um, I, I, I remember that really well. Whom the Son sets free. Is free indeed. That's amazing. Yes. So right now, at this moment, your, your life's calling is to see as many people as possible, three, through the Teen Challenge, right? Because Absolutely. It, yes, yes. You said that you, you, you listen to thousands and thousands of men, of uh, uh, testimonies right yeah many 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 i've been with teen challenge now for 22 years uh before that uh, i served at the los angeles rescue mission on what they call skid row in los angeles and i ran the program there for eight years so 30 years plus um, serving at my local church working with people who were addicted to drugs and alcohol and and gambling and all kinds of things 
uh, this has been my life work, uh, is to co-labor with the Lord. You know, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that God has given to us the, the word and ministry of reconciliation. Mm. And so to see people reconcile to God, uh, because that's why Christ came, to bring us back into fellowship with the Father. And so to see people reconciled to God and reconciled to one another uh, and living lives of destiny and purpose, there's no greater calling. There's no yeah. higher calling than that. And what a privilege to be a part of God's kingdom, to share the good news. Because you're mentioning uh, LA. Um, I remember when I went to, when I was in California a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and I was supposed to preach at an event that had people that came out of prison, but they were in rehab. Yes. There were Mexicans, there were white people, there were black people mm -hmm. um, covered in tattoos. And when they gave their life to Christ, you know, their eyes did not belong to that body. They were a completely new. There was a light. <laughs> there was something else. And yes. I said, hey, these are my brothers in Christ. And they said, listen, I was addicted since I was a kid. I was addicted to cocaine. I was addicted to heroin and all that. You cannot understand how tough it is. Mm. But when Jesus came in my life, yes. when I received power from the Holy Ghost, from the Holy Spirit, I became a new person. I was like, some of these folks were criminals mm. and, yes. and now they started loving other people. Yes. They go in the suburbs of, of California and, and uh, of Los Angeles and they, they start preaching the gospel. Yes. And then I looked at my life and I said, I never did drugs and, and co cocaine and all, all sorts of, of these bad things, mm. but I know I sinned against God. Yes. So you can today, if, if, if we're looking in, in this world, you can actually be in bondage and not having committed all these bad things. Yes. And I wanted to ask you, what is the good news? The good news is that God's kingdom is here. That's what Jesus came preaching. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand or has come upon you. In order for there to be a kingdom, there must be a king uh, and there must be a dominion or a territory. And Jesus is that king who had come to bring uh, the message of hope to the, the, the lost humanity. And so the, the, the gospel is, is that message of the kingdom that we can be free now, that we don't have to be bound in sin. We don't have to walk in condemnation. We don't have to walk in fear and guilt and, guilt and hopelessness and shame. He came to, to change that whole paradigm. And so that is the good news is that Jesus came into the world to seek and to save those who are lost. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we were all lost until Jesus came and now we've been found. Not that I found him, but he came he looking for me. You know, he, the, Jesus talks about the, the, the good shepherd leaving the 99 to go yeah. get the one lost sheep. He's come after a whole lot of one lost sheep and have brought us together as a family in him. And what a joy. That's amazing. What a love. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I remember that, that saying that Jesus, Jesus is the friend of sinners. Yes. That's just such an amazing statement. Amen. I wanted Amen. to ask you, Brother Ron, um, how did you give your life to Christ? How did, God, did Christ actually um, uh, find you? Well, he found me when I was nine years old. Really? <laughs> so I gave my heart to the Lord when I was nine years old. Um, it was a very difficult season of my life at that time. My parents had divorced and, oh, and my mother was re remarried and it was a very tumultuous household that we were living in. Um, and I needed peace in my heart and peace in my mind and I was looking for Jesus and didn't know it, but I, would, I went to the church. It was always a tradition uh, to go to church. Uh, but this one day that I went, and I went with the intention, not just to live according to the faith of others around me who are adults, but I needed my own faith for peace in my own heart. Uh, and I remember sitting there listening to the message that was being preached. I don't even know what the message was because I was so locked into a desire to, to be free um, and to, to really come to know who God was so that I could know who I was. Uh, and at nine years old, you know, they say, well, you have to repent of your sins. And so I'm sitting there going, okay, well, I, I said, I, I hit my sister. I said something wrong. <laughs> I did. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of all that I pinched my cousin or whatever. I'm trying to think of all the things that I did uh, I, to, con con to confess all of my sins. 
And so I was sitting there and I said, well, okay, I guess I've confessed all my sins now, so I, I guess I'm good. And then I just opened my heart and I said, Lord, forgive me. Um, and from that day forward, the Lord Jesus really came into my life. And, and I've been following him uh, ever since. And it's been a joy um, in every season to find the hope that only Christ can give. So I got saved when I was nine. And um, of course, when I became a teenager and a young adult, uh, I walked away from the things of God for a season, like most kids do. Yeah. You know, you just gotta go and see what's in the world. Uh, but very short season, I was, I was right back because- um, <laughs> You've when, experienced what, oh, what it means, the love of God. When you experience Jesus, uh, yeah. there's an old expression in the southern part of our country in the U.S. that says you've been ruined. It means, <laughs> it means you've been ruined because nothing else will satisfy you. Yeah. Like there's no the, comparison. No comparison like the presence of God. And he is really my everything. Uh, and I'm so glad that I know him. So how can you handle um, a season in your life that, that it seems that there's no hope? Mm. You're going through a rough patch. What can someone do in that a period of time? It's really, prayer is so key. Um, prayer is not a time for us to just give a monologue of our needs and requests to God, but it's really a time to really fellowship with Him. It's a time that we sit and not just tell God what we need, uh, but also to get to know Him. Uh, I read a passage in the message yesterday you were sharing uh, about that says, my sheep know my voice yeah. and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. Uh, and so we have to get to know God's voice. Um, and we have the 66 books of the Bible that really give us God's voice. And so reading God's word, understanding um, the dynamics of the kingdom and his heart uh, and his will, uh, and then living and aligning our lives to what God's word says, it helps us to be able to know what his voice is. You know, some people say, well, I'm trying to hear God's voice. And I said, just read the Bible. <laughs> if you read the Bible, you will know his voice because he shares what he thinks about the issues of life, about the issues of your heart, about relationships, uh, about everything uh, that concerns us. And so prayer is really one of the keys, I believe, of, of being in that place of fellowship with God uh, that we're able to have the ability to have hope in this world in any season of our lives. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I actually listened to you yesterday and you, and you were mentioning a, a lot about having a prayer life. But sometimes when you go through life, you know, there are those seasons once you get married. Oh, mm. It's amazing. It's, it's <laughs> yes. great, you know. Yes. But then, you know, time goes, you know, and you discover some things. And, and I believe it's like this in your life with Christ. There are times when you, you feel as if you are on, on Mount Everest, right? Yes. You're, you're, it's there, you feel the presence of God, but sometimes you go through deep valleys. Yes. How can you develop a prayer life when you're not led by your emotions, mm. but you feel God close? Because God is always close to us, right? Yes. But yes. sometimes we feel that He's far away. What, what mm. are some, I don't know, pieces of advice? Because you're a man of prayer. Well, He says in His Word that He's near to those who have a broken and a contrite heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and circumstances of life can really break you. You know, you go through the loss of a loved one, uh, a loss of a relationship, uh, calamity in, in, in health and different things that come that we have no control over. He's the sovereign of the universe. And it's in those times that we must trust in Him. Uh, trust is really the foundation of relationship. And so uh, if we learn to trust in Him, in His character, in what He says, then when we go through those uh, difficult days and seasons in life, we have hope because we know that the sovereign of the universe, we're talking about the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God who has all power and all authority is concerned about each individual person. Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field and the sparrows yeah. and the little birds in the sky. And Solomon was dressed like them. Exactly. And, and the, your father knows every sparrow uh, and when a little bird falls, how much more your heavenly father loves you. And so God cares about lost humanity. He cares about all of us. Uh, and so he walks with us in the 
high mountaintop times, and he also walks with us through the valleys. So he's the God of the valley. He's also the God of the mountaintop. Uh, and he never leaves us. Jesus said, I would never leave you. I would never forsake you. Hmm. I'll always be with you. And he doesn't change. You know, sometimes our friends um, have sunny times and maybe not so sunny times with us, but he doesn't change. He's the same. Jesus Christ is the, the same, same yesterday, yesterday today, today, and forever. And so whatever season of life that you're going through, Jesus will always be there. All we have to do is call on his name. Uh, and he's there listening. And, and knowing God's word and understanding the scriptures, I always encourage people to memorize scriptures, to, to know the word of God, because when God wants to speak to you, he will speak back to you through his voice, through his word. And so if you know his word, then the Holy Spirit can bring that to your, your mind in a moment of crisis, in a moment of difficulty. Uh, and, when you're and attacked. When you're you attacked, know. oh yeah, by the enemy and just life circumstances, that word can just give you strength and encouragement and hope to get through those times of testing. You said something um, great. God is, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, but you also mentioned that this means that his miracles are the same yesterday, today, uh, and forever. Talk to me yes. about this a little bit. Well, he's the same God with the same glory, uh, and his story never changes. And that consistency of character, when you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you see that God was intimately involved with mankind. It really is his story, you know, history. This is all God's story. This is his story, not our story. That's good. That's and good. so he's the author and the initiator of the story. And so he writes every page and every paragraph. And so the volume of God's word speaks of Jesus. Uh, and so he's also the author of life. He's author of our lives. Uh, all life emanates from God. And so when he begins to work in our lives and we get to know him, he writes the chapters of our lives and he doesn't just leave our lives up to chance. No person's life is up to chance. God is intimately involved in developing his plan, his purpose, and his destiny for each and every one of us. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says that we are God's workmanship, yeah, workmanship. Cre created in Christ Jesus for good works that God planned beforehand that we would walk in. And so um, he's writing the pages. He's writing the pages of our lives. So we're not alone. God is with us. And you were mentioning about um, God having plans for you and God having thoughts for you, meaning that they're almost the same thing. And I have a question here. How could someone actually discover what is God's will for his life? Usually when we ask this question, we, we, we think about who am I going to marry, with, <laughs> yes. uh, what job am I going to have? But I think it's more than this, right? How can you discover what is God's will, God's plan, God's thought or thoughts for your life? Well, it's very clear in the scripture that he came to cleanse us and to wash our sins away, take away the condemnation uh, and, and give us brand new life. So his purpose in all of our lives is to transform us into the image of his son. That's, that's God's overarching purpose is that we would know Christ uh, and that we would be like him. Um, and that we would follow the Lord, that we would be humble, that we would be servants of the Lord. And that's really what God is, is most interested in developing up in us, is the character and, and the nature of Christ. When we're born again, uh, he gives us a brand new nature. He, he takes away the old nature, and now we have a nature that, that wants to do the right thing. We have a nature that wants to follow God. We have this innate desire to do what God says. And so with that brand new nature and, and transformation that he brings on the inside, we used to sing an old song that Jesus on the inside, working on the outside, mm. oh, what a change in me. And, and so it's that working on the inside that he works out into our lives uh, his plan. And his plan is that we would be transformed into the image of his son, that we would be like Jesus, that we would love people, that we would care for people, um, that we won't be judgmental or bitter or unforgiving condemning people, yeah. and condemning other people. Uh, so that's really his plan. Now, the other things 
concerning who you marry and what job and what career They're and all of those of things. Plan. You discover those things along the way because when we come to Christ, he places us in the body of Christ. This is what we call the church. And so we have other people that are matriculating along this spiritual journey with us, pastors and evangelists and prophets and apostles and teachers, as it talks about in Ephesians 4, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so they help us and we help one another uh, find our way through life and, and their safety, the book of Proverbs says, in a multitude of godly counsel. And so he puts people around us. Uh, and so that also helps us to be able to discover on our journey, some of those things in life and help us to figure out what path we are to follow. God uses people to help us yeah. as well as his word uh, and the, the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. And he uses all of that together to help us to find his will in yeah. all of those areas of our lives. No, that's that's phenomenal. When you look at um, God's plan, as you've mentioned, there's a general plan, meaning that He wants us to know Christ. He wants yes. us to be changed, to be transformed, to be um, to give our lives uh, our lives to Him. But then we're talking about a specific plan for each individual. Mm -hmm. And here I wanted to ask you, how did you know that you were called uh, to be a part of this ministry of seeing people being delivered, of of seeing people being set free through a Teen Challenge? Because this, this is your, uh, your main mission of your life, right? Yeah, absolutely, for the last 22 years. Wow. And oh, what a joy. <laughs> and we've seen so many lives transformed. And every time I hear a testimony, it's fresh, it's new, it's vibrant. You it's want alive. some more. You know, yes, absolutely. Because I want to see more people find that freedom in Christ. But the Lord really, it was just how God led my wife and I. Again, like I said, you, you discover Uh, your purpose uh, and, and that walk with God through other people in the church. And I remember one Sunday, I was uh, serving at the church on the worship team and doing things in the church and our senior pastor preached a message and he said, what are you doing to change the world around you uh, in your community uh, individually when you're away from the, the congregation of the saints? And I'm, And it was a real challenging message. And so my wife and I were driving home after the service and I said, well, honey, what do you think that message means? I said, we've been doing everything we know to do. Um, I'm at the church every time the door opens. I'm teaching Bible study. I'm in the choir. We had a food pantry at the church. So we're giving away food to the poor. And I said, is there something else we should be doing? And she said, you know, I just had a thought. She said, there's a park near our home where people sleep on benches. Mm and they're alcoholics and they're drug addicts. She said, you know, we've never stopped to even say hello to those people. And I thought, well, that's a novel idea. So she went home and she made a pot of soup and we went to the park and just sat and just started meeting people and listening to their stories. How did they end up in the park, homeless, uh, with no hope in this world, using drugs? And everybody's story was different. Uh, they were not the same. They came from different uh, backgrounds. backgrounds, from different economic uh, situations, uh, different cultures, but they were all together now in this place of hopelessness and despair. And as we began to listen to their stories, God just really began to grip our heart that this is a place that he wanted us to serve, to bring hope to those who are addicted, to those who have no hope, those who are bound, those who are lost. And so we started going on a regular basis, taking soup to the park and ministering to folks. And then they started listening to us as we shared the gospel with them. Uh, they wanted to go to church with us. So we started wow. taking them to church with us and uh, they got baptized and, and they, uh, we start having Bible study with them and they start leaving their drug paraphernalia behind and saying, I want to follow God. I want to do something useful with my life. And so we were doing that at our local church and God was using that for people to come to the Lord. And then there was a friend of mine who was an evangelist, came through to our church and he saw what my wife and I were doing. He said, hey, this thing that you're doing here is powerful. But he said, I know a place in Los Angeles where they need help. Uh, to, uh, to, to do this kind of work full time. You ever considered that? I said, I didn't know about it. Again, we find out our destiny because we're connected to the body of Christ. And, and he it's said, step by step, right? Step it, it, it's, by step. It, it keeps revealing. It, it's progressive. It progressive. There's a progressive revelation that God brings. So I said, well, maybe I should go check this place out. 
And so I flew down to Los Angeles from where we were, and, um, and I saw what they were doing there, uh, working with addicted people uh, in a program that was very similar to what Teen Challenge is. And I thought, wow, I just began to weep, and I felt the, the Lord speak to me and said, this is where I want you to serve. And I went back and I told my wife, and she said, God's already spoken to me because I was praying while you were gone. Wow. And she said, we're moving, aren't we? I said, yes. And so we did, we took our two daughters and we moved there and we served there for eight years. Uh, and after being there for eight years, seeing a lot of lives change, a lot of miracles, uh, I got a call one day from uh, the executive director for Teen Challenge of Southern California. And he said, hey, I hear about the great work that you've been involved in down there, the, the rescue mission. Have you ever thought about coming to work at Teen Challenge? And I went, well, no. I said, I know what Teen Challenge is because I read the book, The Cross and the Switchblade, when I was, right, a, when I was a young teenager. And it, it inspired me to start a Christian club on my secular high school campus. And wow. everyone who joined the club got a copy of The Cross and the Switchblade, a Bible, and a copy of Run, Baby, Run, Nikki Cruz's book. And I said, so I said, wow, I never thought about serving at Teen Challenge, but what we do here at the mission is very similar. Uh, and so God just really gave my wife and I peace. And so uh, so I, I joined Teen Challenge and I've been serving there ever since for 22 years. And then we have the wonderful Teen Challenge ministry here in Romania uh, that was started 20 years ago and now in Cluj. I'm so excited to see what God is doing in Teen Challenge around the world and more than a hundred nations of the world and thousands of men and women's lives being transformed by the power of the gospel. Uh, but it was really a, a series of things that God brought into our lives. It's like a puzzle, yeah. piece by piece. Piece by piece, I heard a message. My wife had an understanding about the, the people in the park uh, that had not really occurred to me and then here we are and then there's this journey that God has taken us on that has brought us to this place and it's a delight to see God transform people's lives through the ministry of Teen Challenge. What is also delightful is the way um, God put this, where, this desire in your heart and then you spoke with your wife and uh, you know those people from the park they wouldn't have given their life to Christ, given their lives to, lived their lives to Christ if there wasn't a couple that would actually go there and, and bring them food. And I'm curious about an important aspect. How did they react when you actually went to them? Did, 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 you, just, did you just shake their hands and ask them how are they doing? How did they react at, at this initial phase of the entire process of just getting to meet them and then yes. getting them to church and all that? Well, they were very grateful uh, that someone noticed um, that, that, that they were there uh, because Addiction is a very lonely, isolated lifestyle. People disconnect from their family, they disconnect from their social service, uh, circle, uh, and they're on their own. Uh, and it meant a lot to them that we even wanted to come and talk to them. Uh, and which, it shouldn't have been that way because we're all the same. You know, God doesn't have favorite kids. <laughs> yeah. we're, all, we're all his kids. But it meant a lot to them for us just to recognize that they were there. Um, and they were very open and very receptive. Uh, because we didn't come to judge them. We yeah. didn't come to, uh, you know. Show that you're better than them. To show, yeah, we didn't come to, you know, we didn't even come there to preach a sermon to them. Uh, we just came there to love them, you know. Jesus said, by love they will know that you are my disciples. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what, we just came to love on them and just to give them some food and just tell them that, hey, there's someone who cares. Uh, but we didn't go there to preach a message to them about salvation and uh, to, to tell them about the Lord. We just wanted to show them love first. And so that was our motivation. And we were hopeful that God would open a door uh, for us to share. Uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Oh, and so when they saw powerful. the care, then they want to know, why are you doing this? What's, what's wrong your, with you people? Yeah, what's your motivation? And then we were able to say our motivation is that God has loved us in the midst of all of our pain, all of our sin, uh, and now we want to love back to whom much is forgiven, much is required. And so we just want to love back um, on, on the people that are around us. And you're in our community, and we want you to know that we're glad you're in our community, and we want to see the absolute best outcome for your life, just like we want to see the best outcome for our own life and our own family. And so they were very open and receptive because we showed care. You don't have to do a lot in order to break into 
uh, the lives of people who are broken. You just have to have a heart to care and compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion and he fed the multitude. Yeah. Jesus was moved with compassion and he healed the sick. Jesus was moved with compassion and he ministered to those who were downcast and, and downtrodden and had no place in society. Uh, and so it's through the compassion of God that opens the door uh, for us to have the privilege, and I consider it a privilege, to be able to share our faith with others. Um, and sure, we can say, okay, it's a duty, it's an obligation. No, it's a privilege, because these are precious people who have a will of their own, uh, and it's a privilege to be invited into their life to be able to share the gospel with them. And not if, but when God is going to actually change them, they are gonna change this world through the power of the gospel and what God has done in their lives. So that, that's, and never discourage someone that he, he, you see him, okay, he's down there in the mm. trenches, oh, mm. he's, he's bad, oh, he's an addict. No, 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 pray for him. And one of the, th the things that I noticed about Teen Challenge, uh, comparing with other uh, uh, ministries that are doing this, you are not an addict. That's not your identity. No, that's a label. That's, 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 a, label. that's a label. And, and the labels gives us um, a, a just a, a right in our mind to ignore people uh, and to not be engaged and involved with them. And so uh, I just want to see people just take labels off of people. You are an addict, you're this, you're that. No, no, no. You are a human being. You're a fellow traveler through this earth just like I am. And all of us are in need of hope. All of us are in need of love. All of us need the, the hope that the gospel brings. Uh, and so when we take the, the labels off of people, then we're able to share. Jesus was asked one, one day, well, who is my neighbor? Uh, and he tells this story that we call the Good Samaritan, uh, how uh, this man was beaten up by robbers left beside the road and several people came by. There were some religious people who came by and they walked by on the other side of the road to go take care of their religious duties at the temple. Uh, but there was one man that stopped and he was not even from the same culture, not even from the same religious identity, but he cared and he was moved with compassion and he took care of the man who was beside the road. And so I believe that's what the Ministry of Teen Challenge uh, around the world and here in Romania too, is really just to stop the care for those who are beside the road of life uh, and they've been beaten up by their addiction, they've been robbed of their dignity, they've been robbed of their identity, and we just wanna stop and say, I recognize you as my neighbor, and so I want to show love to my neighbor. And we're to love the Lord with our God, with uh, our God, with all of our heart, soul, mind, yeah. and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. And so, if I'm eating, then my neighbor should be eating. If I'm free from drugs, then my neighbor should be free from drugs. And that's such a such a huge point and and such a powerful statement. You know, when when um, the enemy looks at us, he's just going to show a lot of labels. Yes. You're a sinner. You're a drug addict. You're a, a pornography addict. You're this and that. Yes. But I never saw Jesus condemning people and putting labels on their uh, on their heads. But, the, but he said this: No, she's my daughter. Yes. He's my son. Yes. And I wanted to ask you this because I believe it's an important topic. How important is it to know your identity? Who are you in Christ? It's extremely important, and and I think that's one of the core principles of the Ministry of Teen Challenge. From the day they come in, we begin to teach them about what the Bible says about who they are uh, as created beings in the image of God. Uh, we start all the way back in Genesis. In the beginning, God created, and the He created and man, the heavens and the earth, and He created man. Uh, and so this is your identity. Your identity was given to you by God not by your culture, not by your society, not by the things that are around you that speak to you, but God is the one who gave us identity from the very beginning of creation. And so through the scriptures, um, they begin to learn at Teen Challenge what their identity is. Um, their, the label, I'm a sinner, okay? Yeah, the Bible says all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. But that's not the whole, no. the whole answer. No, it isn't. You are a lost son who sins. Yeah. 
but you are a son, <laughs> you are a daughter, you're created in the image of God, and there's sin that God has already taken care of and paid the penalty for mm. through the sacrifice of his only begotten son on the cross. So don't just stick with the label of sinner, stick to what God has said, he came to seek and to save sinners. He came to seek and save those who were lost, those who did not know their way back to the Father's house. You know, that great uh, uh, story that Jesus tells about the young son who yeah. took his inheritance and he went away. But the, prodigal the, son. the prodigal son, uh, I believe the father in that story is God. He was always waiting for his son to come home. And he was praying. He was praying. And so we have many lost sons and daughters. And I say what Teen Challenge does is we, we keep the doors open and the light on hmm. for sons and daughters to come back home. And, and there's also an important aspect about um, how you uh, see yourself as a person. Mm -hmm. If you're just gonna keep saying, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. Basically what you're doing, this is actually um, uh, really bad from this uh, standpoint. If you say you're a sinner, then you're diminishing God's ministry mm -hmm. in your life. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are a sinner, but you are saved by grace. Yes. That's very important. And, yes. and when you look at the cross and, and what Jesus did out there on the cross, that's a, that's a tremendous, that's a, that's a huge sacrifice that He did for the entire world. Yes, and, yes. and you brought up this, this point with the prodigal son. You know what's... And I always kept thinking about this. There are two prodigal sons, and, and you know this. One yes. was in the house. Yes. And, and one was outside. Correct. <laughs> but I think that the baddest one, the worst one, was the one in the house. Mm. Because even though he had the father, yes. even though he had the blessings, mm -hmm. he didn't realize, I have a relationship with my father. But when the other one who was in the world, he went to the pigsty, he said, my father. I remember. Yes. I remember. Yes. He actually knew, you know, he kind of he kind kind of looks like the stupid one, but but I think he's the wisest one because he comes back home. Yes. He has prepared <laughs> his speech and all that, but he knows his father. I know his character. I know yes. he's going to do this. I, I know he's going to forgive me. Yes. And and I had this image from the Lord, you know, I had two rocks. Yes. If you go to the mount, mountain mm -hmm. and you go to a river, you see rocks that are sitting outside and you see rocks in the river. Yes. If you take both rocks, mm -hmm. you look at one and you look at the other one. The one on the river is wet, right? Mm. It looks as if it's filled with water. Mm. But if, if you take something and break them, yes. both of them don't have water inside. That's correct. The, the, the rock in the river was the sun in the house. Mm. This one, the other rock, was the sun in the world. But here was the thing that I realized, it's, it, it's not just being surrounded by the blessing, it's mm. not just being surrounded by, by the Father, by His presence, but also having a personal relationship with Him, yes. and being filled with life, being filled mm. with joy. Yes. And I wanted to ask you this, uh, Brother Ron, um, how can you have joy in the Holy Spirit? Because <laughs> once, once someone gives his life to Christ, mm -hmm. that's not the end of the story. No, that's just the beginning. I believe that's just the beginning, <laughs> just as the you beginning. said. Yes. <laughs> and then you go to the next step and to the next step. How important is the Holy Spirit? Because joy is, um, is one, one of the results that you have, right? But yes. Just describe to me, what's, what's it like to have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit? Wow. Well, the, the, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 is love and joy, Patience. peace, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faith faith, patience, self-control, those are all a, a part of the Holy Spirit's fruit that is born in our lives when we're born again. Because Jesus said uh, when, when the Pharisee Nicodemus came to him um, at night and he began to explain to him what salvation was. I guess I want to be born again. Yeah, you must be born again yeah. of the Spirit. And so it's the Holy Spirit that regenerates us and, uh, and gives us that new nature I was sharing about earlier. And so we're born again by the Spirit of God. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us this new identity, this new nature, uh, this new walk, this new love, this new joy. So joy is really a byproduct of, of a relationship that is fulfilled uh, and, and, and that is growing uh, and that is blossoming. And so we have a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, and joy is the byproduct of that relationship. You know, when you, um, 
when you're in a good relationship with your wife, yeah. you're in a good relationship with your children and so forth, and, and people in your life, there's a joy that is created when you see them. You can just think about them and all of a sudden you start smiling uh, because they bring joy to you because you're in relationship with them. And when we're in relationship with God through the power of the Holy Spirit, there's a joy that is produced uh, because of the connection. And, and that's one of the, the pernicious things about addiction is it disconnects people from, yeah. from joy. It disconnects them from life. It disconnects them from friends and family. Uh, and so they don't have the ability to have strength to endure. Uh, because Nehemiah 8.10 says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Mm -hmm. And so when we have joy, we have strength. We have the ability to overcome life circumstances and to move forward. So joy is a very, very important uh, product uh, of the Holy Spirit in our lives because it gives us the strength through that relationship to be able to overcome all of the obstacles of life that, that, that the world throws at us. The reason I was asking you this question is because this is the devil's lie. Yes. If you come to me, I'll give you true joy. Mm. I'll give you money, I'll give you fame, I'll give you prosperity, whatever. If mm. you go and have this drug, you'll be joyful, you'll, you'll have happiness. Mm. Whereas if you have a true relationship with Christ. Yes. If you have the Holy Spirit, that's true happiness. Yes. That's true joy. And that's one of the tricks uh, and tactics of the enemy is to try to get people to believe that they are missing something uh, that God has already given to them. That was the lie that Adam and Eve fell for in the garden. I have something better. Yeah. God's holding something back from you. So that's why he doesn't want you to eat off that tree because he knows that, you know, you'll really be uh, who you're supposed to be. They already were who they were supposed to be. They were created in the image of God. And so he doesn't have any new tricks or new tactics. So he tells the same lie uh, that you need something else uh, in order to be validated as a person of value. Uh, and it was the same temptation that he came to Jesus with in the wilderness. You know, if you turn these stones in the bread, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you do this, if you do this, I'll give you this, I'll give you this. Jesus already had all those things. Um, and so the enemy always tries to get us to believe that we're missing something so that we start going after that rather than treasuring what we already have uh, with the Lord. And as you said, and I think we should put a lot of emphasis on, the, on, on uh, this point, it's crucial that we know the Word of God. Yes. Because, God, yes. because uh, the enemy usually takes uh, the scripture out of context. He, he twists Indeed. God's truth. Indeed. And, and, I, and, I, I, and I saw the tactic that uh, Jesus had. It is written that. It is also written that he knew the word. And the more you know the word, the more you're going to know and distinguish God's word, God's voice from the, the enemies. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we, we were sharing about that a moment ago. Yeah. How important it is if you don't know the voice. I have people say, I don't know the voice of God. I say, His Word is His voice. Yeah. Uh, and it was that Word, that voice of God that Jesus used to really blunt every temptation that the enemy brought to Him. And so when temptation comes, it's the Word, God's living Word. Uh, Hebrews 4.12 says that God's Word is living. It's powerful. It's like a sword. It's like a sword. It's yeah. sharper than a two-edged sword. And so that Word really helps to destroy the lies of the enemy that takes people off course. And you just have to proclaim it. Yes. You have to know it. Yeah. You have to believe it. Uh, and you have to activate it by speaking it and proclaiming it. Yes, you have to speak the Word as well as know it in your mind and know it in your heart. Yeah. Let's say someone, uh, this is actually the, the, the truth, someone is right now watching, right? Is watching right now and he's struggling with addictions. What's the secret to be free from addictions? Well, the freedom from addiction comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And let's say maybe they have a relationship with Christ, but they've walked away and and and, the way. and yeah, and it's not as as connected as they should be. Uh, I would say come home uh, to the presence of God. God loves you. Um, he's not angry with you. Uh, remember when that prodigal son came home? The father didn't have a bat behind his back waiting to hit him over the head. He just welcomed him. 
He, he ran to him. He ran to him. He, he got his clothes a little bit up, and that was something. I, I just <laughs> yes. read about the context. I was kind of like, what is this guy doing? Yes. He shouldn't be doing this. Usually ladies would just run to their kids. Mm -hmm. But he, and I, I, I'm sorry, but I'm very passionate about, about this. So he goes to him. He hugs him. Yes. He gets his dirt. Yes. He kisses him. Yes. He gives him a ring. Yes. He brings the fattened calf. Yes, he put shoes on his feet. <laughs> Let's have a party. <laughs> Let's have a party. <laughs> I literally started crying. Yes. And that's what the Father, he just waits for us to come home. He loves us so much, and he's just waiting for you to come home. Just call on the name of the Lord. God is not angry with you, and he loves you. He has a plan for you. That's what I would say to them. It's inside of that relationship with Christ that there's safety. Inside of that relationship with Christ, there's strength. Inside of that relationship with Christ, there is an ability to be set free and to move away from the bondage of the addiction uh, and to, to walk in the identity that God has for you as a son or daughter of the Lord. You said something that sounds um, unimaginable. And also, God is crazy about you. What hmm. does that mean? Wow. That means, I know what that means, but I'm asking for some people, uh, I'm asking for, because also our audience, some yes. of them and most of them are not Christians. Yes. And when they're hearing this, they're like, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean God is crazy about me? No, God is somewhere there. He doesn't care about our lives. No. I want to ask you, what does it mean God is crazy about you? Wow. Because He created you and He loves the creation of His hand. Now, you can look at His handiwork, the moon, the stars, the planets, and all the, the earth, all the things that he created in inanimate objects, the animals, but his crowning achievement in creation was created man, wow. and he yeah. created man in his own image. And so he loves his image in the earth. And so when he looks at you, he sees himself because we're created in his image. And so he loves you uh, because he, he made you and he has a plan and a purpose for your life to prosper you and not to harm you but to give you a future and a hope. And so you think about, you know, I have nine grandchildren and- Wow, and how many kids do you have, first of all? Because I didn't ask about this yeah. <laughs> you, you could actually have a soccer team if you think about it. <laughs> yeah, I had thought about that. <laughs> but yeah, I have two, two children, two grown children wow. who are married and- and, God bless them. and we have nine uh, grandchildren. And when I see when I see them, I'm just I'm crazy, crazy them. about them, you know. Yeah. I mean, they don't have to say much to to get me to try to get whatever I can to make them happy. You just want to grab them by the cheeks oh. and hug them, just, but just grab them. And <laughs> I'm crazy about them because they're part of me. They're part of my life. They're part of my family. And you invested your life into them. Um, yes, and that's what God has done for us. And so when I say He's crazy about us, uh, He loves us. And and I love how you pointed out in that that story of the prodigal son, that the father didn't wait for the son to get a bath and to get cleaned up and to get his hair all shiny, uh, but he grabbed him just the way he was, uh, and he was not afraid to step into his world uh, and to bring him into his world again. And that's what Jesus did. He came all the way from heaven and he stepped into our world. He stepped into human flesh and he stepped into all of the brokenness yeah. and the shame uh, of our lives. He stepped in to bring us in to Him. And that's what I mean by He's crazy about you, that He was willing to leave all of His glory to step into human flesh, wow. to become like us so that we have a high priest who can now be touched with the feeling of our weaknesses and our that's infirmities amazing. because He understands Praise us. God. He's crazy about us and He just wants us to come home. And He steps into the life of an addict. He steps into the life of the addicted. He steps into their lives by His Spirit because He wants to bring you out of that into the presence of His Holy Spirit so that you will be the person that He created you to be. Amazing. Preach, brother. Preach. <laughs> uh, we could speak for hours and hours about God's love in this, uh, and about this prodigal son. You know, the title is given the prodigal son, but I heard Tim Keller said this, and I don't want to steal this from him because it was his idea. I, I mean, he originally said this. It's the prodigal father who gives a lot of grace gives a lot of love mm. it's it's being prodigal with this he yes. gives his riches and and right now i'm a father 
Yes. When I would preach from this text when I didn't have any kids, I was like, oh, th th that guy was wrong. He was wrong. <laughs> Now I look at my family, I look at my wife, I look at my, 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 my son Chris, he's three years old, yes. my daughter Esma Rose, he, she's uh, one year and a half, and I sometimes mm. just pray for them and cry, and I say, just mm. please protect them. Yes. But when I look at them, I understand the heart of the father that the prodigal father had. Yes. He didn't care what other people, his workers, he didn't care what they mm. feel about him. How could he do something like this? Mm. But because of this, his son's true repentance showed up. He yes. didn't care what other people think about him anymore because yes. he knew his father's identity. He knew his mm. father's character. And one last question because we can talk <laughs> about the time is up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I would have talked. But uh, I, it's been a joy. I, I, I really know, enjoyed it, meeting yeah, you. It felt <laughs> as if 10 minutes. But one last question. And yes. this is, I think this is like the, um, the cherry on top of, of the ice cream or the cake. Mm. Why Jesus? Because God gave him mm. to us. Why Jesus? Because this is God's plan. Jesus, uh, the, the Bible says that God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Uh, as high as the heavens are from the earth, so are my thoughts and my ways are different from yours. Why Jesus? Because this is who God has chosen. And when you're the king, you get to make the rules. And this is what God says, this is the way. Um, there's the way to salvation and it's through Jesus. And so this is God's way. So either you will follow God's way or you will try to become a God yourself and follow your own way. And you're gonna mess it up. <laughs> and you're gonna mess it up. So the reason for Jesus is because God said, this is my plan. See, God is a God of plan. He, all issues concerning salvation are set in motion by God. Mm -hmm. So he's the one who gets to choose Amen. all the players on the team. You talked about me having a team, a, a football team. Jesus is the answer for the world today because he's the one that God gave to us. Brother Ron, it was <laughs> such an amazing experience. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I pray for you that the Holy Spirit will protect your family. Thank you. Also your ministry and may He use you with His great power because you're speaking in Jesus' name and may He be with you until you go to heaven. Amen. Thank you, dear brother. Thank you so and much. And God bless you for all that you're doing for God's kingdom. And the whole team that here is working tireless, tirelessly to make this message go in the whole world. Amen. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Dragi ascultători, vreau să vă mulțumesc că ați rămas până aici. Nu uitați, pentru cei care sunteți dependenți, pentru cei care treceți prin diverse perioade grele, Domnul Isus Hristos este răspunsul. In Jesus, there, in Domnul Isus Hristos este putere, în El este eliberare, pentru că acolo veți descoperi o dragoste adevărată care întrece orice așteptare, orice lucru. Vă aștept și data viitoare la un alt episod din De Vorbă Podcast. Până atunci, toate cele bune! Mm -hmm.